Copernicus. And I thought what I'll do is I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about sort of the structures and frameworks of what I think is going on right now. So we're going to talk about Copernicus, which I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with. And then we're going to talk a little bit about industrial revolutions. And then we're going to get into sort of what it means to market in this sort of new day and age, uh, which is where we get to the human to human part. And, uh, and what I'll do is sort of like at the end of the sort of more sort of academic beginning of this, and just before we get into some of the more practical stuff, I'll sort of stop and sort of see if you have questions or things you want to know, and we can just kind of go back and forth and sort of quiz each other that way. And then I'll leave time at the end uh, for questions as well. And even right now, I'll say, do you have any questions yet? <laughs> I've answered them all so far. Great. Awesome. OK, so does everyone know who Copernicus is? I'm not seeing a rousing show of hands here, so I'm going to tell you who Copernicus is. So Copernicus was, uh, was actually a deacon in the Catholic Church and an astronomer uh, back in the uh, 1500s. And uh, he was assigned a task, which was to improve the quality of the calendar, because they could never quite predict Easter correctly. And the reason was that they had this sort of view of the universe, which is uh, known as uh, Ptolemaic. And so the Ptolemaic view of the universe was one where the Earth was flat, and at the center of the universe. Ironically, a theory that seems to be coming back. Um, so, but it's been had a good, it's got a good solid 500 year run, so feeling good about that. And so, so he actually went through this whole sort of torturous sort of uh, calculations. And what they were doing at the time is they were putting calculations on top of calculations to try to predict things like the retrograde motion of Mars. They're trying to understand you know, how the, when the solstice would occur. And they never could quite get it right. And so, um, so one day, Copernicus thought to himself, well, what if the Earth is not the middle of the universe? You know, what if the Earth goes around the sun? And it was a bit of a controversial statement at the time, because I find, if you ever stand in a field, I mean, I do this all the time, stand in a field for a couple of days, right? What you'll notice is that the sun comes up on the left, right, and goes overhead, facing first, goes overhead, and then goes down on the right, and then the next morning comes back up on the left, and goes overhead, and goes down on the right, planet feels flat and not moving, it's a perfectly rational thing to say the sun is going around the earth. It totally looks like that. Um, but so he said, let's flip it around. And when he did that, all the calculations fell in place. So, you know, sort of, why am I telling you the story of Copernicus? So this is the universe that he lived in. This is the universe that he proposed. And this is the conflict between the two universes. Now, what's interesting about Copernicus is that he didn't really invent anything. Right? He didn't really invent anything, but he's credited with unlocking and opening up the scientific revolution that we're still benefiting from today. So what did he do? Right? What was the thing that he did that made that so special? Why did it be, why was it so powerful? I know the answer already, so I, that would be where you can tell me why you thought that was powerful. Again, you're my favorite audience no, member. No. <laughs> I'm just going to focus 100% on you right now. <laughs> Any ideas? Well, okay, I'll, 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 throw, I'll throw it out to you. So uh, he matched perception to reality. And the problem in life and the problem in, in work and everything we're doing is very often the way we perceive things is not the way they really are. And when we perceive things differently from the reality, it's very hard to make the right decisions about what to do next. And so by matching perception to reality, Copernicus was able to unlock this sort of wellspring of ideas and calculations and scientific discovery that they didn't really know kind of even existed. So this idea of matching perception to reality. So why, you know, why, why am I telling you this story? You're probably wondering, why is he telling me this story? <laughs> now he's asking me to tell him why he's telling me this story? What is going on here? No, seriously, why am I telling this story? Do we feel like there's something similar in our lives today? I think there is, right? I think there is. It's not social so much as if you think about the world that we live in, we have tended to always live in a product-centric universe, which, you know, again, to, the, to kind of giving credit to the flat earthers, still standing there and observing the world naturally, it feels pretty normal. And we live our lives in a product universe. We go into our little job, we spend our time with our coworkers, we talk to other people. Like that's the universe that we live in. But in fact, the reality of it, and it's always been true, is that the customers have always been the center of our universe. 
we've not really had to worry about it very much because for a long time, customers didn't have any power. But with the rise of the network, customers now have power have been an existential threat to the future of a company. And so this idea of customers being at the center and having this power, I think it's a really new one. You know, I've, I've been in you know, a bunch of different businesses over the years. I never worked in a business where anyone said, I don't care about my customers. Everyone always cared about their customers. That's always true. Customers number one, those have been slogans going back 100 years. But for today, what's different is that if you don't care about your customers, your customers can destroy your brand. And so, how do you deal with customers in that age? And I think one of the things that for me is most powerful is that the way that customers expect to be treated, because they now know they have that power, is at a much different level than what we've engineered our organizations to deliver. And most of our organizations have been engineered to deliver a broadcast message from a small number of marketers. Think about marketing departments in most companies, tiny, like tiny departments compared to the overall size of the company. And so that giant broadcast message coming from a very small number of people was great at a time when you had broadcast, but it's a lot harder to do in an age where people expect one-to-one -one relationships. I'm going to come to that a bit. So what is going on, right? We're living in the middle of, or the beginning of, a fourth industrial revolution. You've probably heard about the different industrial revolutions. It's been talked about for a while. Um, the first one, of course, mechanical. The second one, electrical. The third one, computer chips. And now where are we living in the time of AI? IoT, natural user interface. Very exciting time to be alive. Now, people typically talk about industrial revolutions from the standpoint of the technology of that revolution, um, but I like to kind of add some sort of marketing pieces to it because there were marketing revolutions that coincided with each of these technology revolutions. And so the marketing revolution of the, of the first age was door-to-door -door salespeople, right? Then we had, and then and the brand at that time was essentially the person selling it. Then brands started to come out, product brands came out, then companies began to own a brand, and then today we're selling experiences. This particular one is um, you know, kind of who was doing, uh, who was doing the selling. There's the traveling salesperson who's doing the selling, there's the copywriter, there's the madman, and then of course today it's everybody. And that's the challenge in most organizations. Everyone actually has to be customer facing. And how do you as an organization engineer the organization so everyone can actually be customer facing in a way that's, that's productive? So if you think about these sort of different trends and these different industrial revolutions, there's like the 19th century model, there's the 20th century model, and the 21st century model. The 19th century, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on it, mostly controlled by wholesalers. But the real difference between the 20th century and 21st century is you're going from a retailer-driven model to a direct-to-consumer model. And you're going, and this is the core of it, the broadcast model of the 20th century would be what we called scaled anonymous to anonymous, which meant that a small number of anonymous people inside the company were speaking to another group of anonymous, anonymous people outside the company. Nobody knew each other. Like, they would run a TV ad, no one knew who made the ad, when they saw the ad, no one knew who saw it. And that was actually an okay balance. People were okay with that because they were equally anonymous. Today what you have is scaled human-to-human -human connections. Where we have a problem is that most companies are maintaining the anonymity of the 20th century while wanting to understand deeply every single bit about your life as a human. And that's where GDPR and all, and just, there's a new one coming up um, on um, e-commerce e e is gonna be even worse than GDPR. But all these laws are coming up because people are like, wait a second, <laughs> you can't know everything about me and I know nothing about you? That is a completely mismatched model. So the model we actually have to move to, which people are more accepting of, is I'll tell you a bunch of stuff about me if you tell me a bunch of stuff about you, a more human to human model. And that scaling that is going to be uh, very tricky. So um, let me, uh, there's sort of three things I think that are going to have to change to make that happen. So 20th century was all about making functions more effective. So it was a very siloed mentality deliberately. 21st century, everyone's going to have to work together to address the customer. In the 20th century, you had, because of the siloed mentality, a lot of small point solutions, typical MarTech stock, 60 to 70 applications in it. 
21st century, you're going to actually have a single integrated application that everyone's working off in the same way against a single customer ID. There's no other way to do it. And the last thing is in the 20th century, and I've referenced this a couple times now, you have this broadcast sort of way of thinking, and what you have to go to is a conversation way of thinking. Conversation way of thinking. So let me talk, let me give you an example of that. So um, my favorite communicators uh, are comedians. And um, I, I, I love stand-up comedians, go to a lot of it, it's very, very fun to watch. And uh, if you think about how a stand-up comedian works, if they wrote a creative brief, their communication objective would be exactly the same. Every comedian would have exactly the same creative brief. So what would a comedian's creative brief be? Make them laugh. Make them laugh, no. <laughs> it's a good guess, that's actually not it. Now think about how you write a creative brief, right? To convince the audience that, convince the audience that I am. Fun, funny. Funny, thank you. Someone said fun. Maybe, but funny for sure, right? Every comedian has the exact same creative brief to convince the audience that I'm funny. That's all they want. They literally have exactly the same product that they're selling. Now, if a marketer was to be a comedian, what would the marketer do, right? The marketer would take that creative brief, come to the front of the stage and say, okay, I've got a message to tell you. So I'm gonna broadcast a message, which is, I am funny. I am funny. I am funny. So I gotta get frequency on it, right? I am funny. <laughs> I am funny. And then I'm gonna have to get some testimonials Brooke, can you give a testimonial to say I'm funny? You are seriously funny, Thank sir. Thank you, Brooke. Okay, the testimonials <laughs> work. We know they work. They're effective. So Brooke said that. And then I'm going to maybe get some multimedia. I'll hand out some flyers. At the end of that performance, you leave. Someone will say to you, um, hey, how was it? And what would you say? You'd say, well, he said he was funny. Right? He said he was funny. And that's the way most marketing works today. We try to drill a thing into people's minds that they, they go, okay, I get that you say that about yourself. I get that. But I don't know if I believe that. In today's world, increasingly, people are more and more skeptical about believing things that they're told to believe. This is where a lot of the, the cycle that we see in politics, people like to go contrary to what they're being told because that feels like the more honest path. So what does a comedian do, right? So a comedian comes out on stage, and a comedian tells a joke, right? Tells a joke, you hear the joke, and then you laugh, okay? You laugh, and while you're laughing, you're thinking to yourself, wow, she's really funny, <laughs> right? She's really funny. And when you leave the performance, someone will say, hey, you know, what was that performance like? And you say, oh, couldn't stop laughing, she was hilarious, one of the funniest comedians I've ever seen. And if someone will say, they'll say to you, like they'll say, well, what were the jokes? Like, tell me some of the jokes that were so funny. And you can never remember the jokes. You know, it was like, there was like this thing with like a mother-in-law and an octopus, and then there was a whale kind of came in. <laughs> but, like, I can't remember the exact, but you remember how you felt. And what were the big mistake we make in marketing today is we're constantly telling people what they should be thinking, and we're not trying to get them to feel something. And to get them to feel something that kind of contributes to the communication objective we have. So that's kind of the, I think for me, that's the biggest change, and that's where, that's where you're gonna to have to go, when you go human to human, humans have to connect on an emotional level. And if your brand is not willing to connect on an emotional level, then you're gonna have a really hard time competing as the years go by. It was interesting, I was at um, Merck Pharmaceuticals yesterday, and, uh, and you know, they have this challenge, which is there's a lot of regulation in pharmaceutical advertising, check. You know, almost every industry has actually got some kind of regulation, but pharmaceuticals, they've got a lot of regulation, no question. But there's no regulation on love. Not yet. Well, it's just coming. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, but uh, there's, no, there's no regulation <laughs> on love right now. You can talk about caring and loving in ways that are compelling to people without having to make a product claim. And think about that a little bit with your, with your product. So, um, so let me just give you a quick example. This is, a, this is something one of our customers, Microsoft, did um, where generic content is what they were doing and they started moving to actual customized content where the actual person is being named. And what's hap what happens when you do that is that people start to go and get connected to the personalized communication. Now, these are examples of Xbox ads. A little hard to see from the back. But what they are, if you look at them, each one has a handle built right into the ad. 
And the pictures are pictures of the people. They're posterized versions of the people. They do half a million of these a year. And the retweet rate was 98.5%, which is a really great way to get organic reach. And so this constant heavy personalization, there are no claims being made in here. There are no claims. But with the heavy personalization creates this affinity and emotional bond to the Xbox brand that drives all sorts of really positive sort of buying and selling behavior. Um, and then they also would do things where they, this is a picture of a couple at E3. I don't know if they're actually a couple, they're standing next to each other. Someone took a picture and they made a Romeo and Juliet quote above it, okay? <laughs> Microsoft took that picture, they put their arms around each other, and they said, hey, if there's hope for them, there's hope for us all. Sent that out and it got retweeted and you know, read by eight or nine million people. Um, and they got picked up in the news. And these are examples of where, without claiming anything, but by being emotionally connected, and, and I, I know it's kind of dirty, right? It proves an inter-console relationship. It's, like, <laughs> it's sort of fun. Um, but by actually being connected to people in a human way, you get a lot of very interesting traction out of it. Um, this is an example, and I'll just tell you what's on the page, but this is a person who got a personalized communication and basically went on a rant of how awesome it was that they were actually addressed personally and connected to personally. It's a, the people are surprised still today when they see that because we still live in what is primarily a broadcast era. And here's, a, here's an example of something that we tend to do, which is um, in Sprinkler, we will follow all the accounts that we want to do business with that are not customers yet. And so we'll follow them and we'll follow their, their CMOs and people like that. And so the CMO for Burger King, which was one of our targets, um, you know, who was kind of in our list, um, put, out a, put out a sort of tweet. And his tweet was, brand new Burger King menu item. And, and hold on to your socks for a second here. I'm going to think this one carefully through. It's the most American food item I can imagine. It's uh, crispy, of course, uh, pretzel, absolutely right, chicken, who doesn't like chicken, fries. Crispy pretzel chicken fries. There's a brand new menu item for Burger King. So I believe they're no longer selling, but three months ago this was a new item. And, um, and so he just said, hey, um, we've got this new thing coming out. So a couple of our community managers, um, who we call experience managers, ran out and they actually bought the very, very first order made in Herald Square and zipped back and did a boomerang and sent it back to the CMO, who was like, oh my God, that's totally awesome, that's amazing. And then what sort of happened was, was this kind of ongoing engagement. You know, they tagged him, put him into the system, and an ongoing engagement starts where yes, he would tweet things about Burger King goes to the like uh, the horse races. You know, we would send a tweet back saying, hey, you know, we love going to the horse races too, and uh, this is how we're thinking of Burger King. And you saw this back and forth engagement with the CMO that is essentially a human to human connection. Now, this is a B two B sale, by right? a multi million dollar enterprise sale. At some point, we're not selling him any sprinkler at this point. Right now, we're talking, talking about Sprinkler. We got the logo on there, but we're basically talking about what's important to him, and we're having fun with it, and having a good back and forth engagement. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff that went on. They, uh, they entered contests, and there's a whole bunch of other things that they did along the way. And then um, one of the experience managers, Sammy, that's her picture there, um, got um, appendicitis, and had to have an emergency appendectomy. Okay? That's not like a, supposed to be funny or anything, that's just a fact. Okay? And so she, she made a comment saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got to go to the hospital for appendicitis. And um, Burger King, at this point, had such an, and this is still not a customer. Not a customer. Okay? And we do this, by the way, hundreds of different times. They sent her a care package with a blanket, little things for her glasses, I'm assuming coupons for crispy pretzel chicken fries, uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And then she took a picture of herself recovering at home under the Burger King swag, um, thanking Burger King for kind of, isn't that, like, what's going on there, right? That's a B2B sale. Now, Burger King is, now we're in the final stages of signing a contract with them, right? But the, and there's obviously a lot of work that went into doing that, but it started with this. And I, I find in B2B, a lot of people will say to me, oh uh, yeah, you know, that social stuff's kind of fun if you're like Wendy's or Coke or something, but that doesn't have anything to do with me, because I, I get people to download white papers. That's my marketing motion. It's like, no, you know what? Everyone is selling to people. And actually the emotion in B2B is the easiest one to sell against. Every B2B sale is literally the exact same, same thing you're selling against. Any idea what that would be?
I bet you know. <laughs> no? Okay. All right. No idea what that would be? What's the one thing you're selling? Everyone's selling the same thing in B2B. When someone makes a purchase of your product in B2B, what are they buying? You. Your relationship? Nope. Experience? It's a good guess. Not quite. They're buying an opportunity for career success. They're buying an opportunity for career success. I was Sprinkler's first customer. When I bought Sprinkler, I was like, this could propel me as an innovative marketing leader at Microsoft. That'd be really cool. And you're also selling against one thing, which is, what are the chances that this will get me fired? I mean, you have to be, then they, one bar has to be a lot longer than the other bar. But those are the two emotions you're selling against. And so I think for me, um, for me it's, like, it's an interesting way of thinking about it. All right, so um, let me sort of stop here for a second, and I'll just uh, I'll take uh, some some questions and stuff like that, and then I'll kind of finish with, uh, I think as we go through the questions, I think I'll, I'll finish with the sort of last chart, and we'll talk a little bit about sort of the model we're going through. Uh, if you please give your name and who you're with. Hi, I'm Adrienne Wallace, and I'm a uh, former CMO of an HR tech company called Boma. So Fortune fa favors the brave, obviously, and you coming over from Microsoft and then this social team going out there and talking to Fernando, D taking, taking liberty with Burger King, is that something that was strategically planned? What is the nature of trust that you're putting in that team? How does that, how does that happen? Uh, great question. Can I unpack it a tiny bit? Just hang on the microphone for a second. Just want to make sure I answer it correctly. So, are you saying, how did we set up the social team inside Sprinkler that drove that engagement, or what was like the strategic instructions that we gave to the team? Were there any real strategic insights about the human to human connection? Obviously, there's a lot of trust top down from you, but how, you know, how do you incite that type of bravery into a mm. social team? Okay, that's interesting. I never thought of it as being brave. Now I'm all nervous. <laughs> what are they doing right now? Um, okay, so uh, let me let me think about that for a second. So the so the way we work is uh, we work with uh, we actually started this relationship years ago. Um, I started with Microsoft, a company called Jeffrey M. And Jeffrey M. set up customer experience centers for all sorts of companies: Samsung, Philips, Coca-Cola, Microsoft, now Sprinkler. And when I arrived at Sprinkler, um, uh, first thing I did is I called them up and said, boom, I need a CXC in place right away. And so we had six people running two, three weeks after I started. And uh, my instructions to them were, we know literally who we want to sell to. Like the, the thing that's, the other thing that's interesting about the world we live in today is that it is strangerless. Like I literally know of 6,000 companies that, I, that should be using Sprinkler that are not right now. And there's about a quarter million people that are on the buying committees of those companies. And you can identify them through LinkedIn, you can identify them through org charts, and you can identify them through a tech we have, which allows us to see the affinity, the social affinities between people inside companies. Which, interestingly, the social affinities between people inside a company is actually the best indicator of the buying committee, not the org chart. So it's super interesting. And so we basically created those listening so all, when any one of those people says something, the team's instructed to engage with them in a way that's relevant. The other thing is that everyone who's an experience manager, and we've got about a dozen now at Sprinkler, um, and Microsoft had about 120, every experience manager signs their posts. That's how they knew it was Sandy. So it's human to human, right? When we do advertising, our ads have a link in them, like most ads. When you click on the link, you're clicking on a link to something called Point Drive, which is inside my LinkedIn. So when you click on our ads that we do broad scale, you'll see me on LinkedIn. And the thing about Point Drive, which is pretty magical, is that if you're logged into LinkedIn, I see that you clicked on it and I see who you are. And people are totally cool with it because they're like, they know it's me. Like they're seeing my LinkedIn profile. So I'm fully exposed, I'm not anonymous. And now we can have an interaction. I, then I'll send them a message. Hey, thanks for clicking on the link. We want to talk about it more. And sometimes they're like, no, I don't. I'm just like, no problem. And sometimes they're like, yeah, I do want to talk more. And so this is like, it's trying to get rid of the corporate BS 
that's caused us to kind of put these walls between each other, and I think it's made it hard for us to be good marketers, because if you think about how you sell something to a friend, I mean, I don't know how you sell things to a friend, but you'll say to a friend, we should go see this movie, and I heard something about this movie, and that's why we should go see it together, and your friend will sometimes buy that from you, mm -hmm. right? The way you talk to a friend is not the way typically people talk to their customers, and that, to me, is a huge problem. Because customers, because customers are living in a world of one-to-one -one connections and living in a world of social um, commerce, essentially, they are beginning to expect to be talked to in a way that is more familiar than companies are typically comfortable doing. Is that helpful? Very helpful. That's great. That's lucky to have you. Thank you. Oh, I'm, thank you. <laughs> board meetings tomorrow. Maybe you could come along. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Tell the board that. <laughs> You, you have a little more time. I don't know uh -huh. if you wanted it. on time? I'm about uh, five minutes, I think. Uh, five more minutes? Okay, so yeah, yeah. why don't I see if there's... Uh, maybe I'll just end with this. I only need about a minute or two. See if there are any other questions right now. That was an awesome question, so I love getting... Additional questions uh, for, for Brad? Really? Here I we go. There's a question. Oh, okay. um, Jeremy Cutner. <laughs> I work at Warner Music Group. Yeah, um, oh, great. I was wondering about the creepy factor with some of the stuff, like how you avoid... Uh, especially on like personalized ads that people see in their newsfeed or wherever, um, or even in the LinkedIn, LinkedIn example you just gave, how do you avoid sort of coming off as creepy, or is that part of the bravery question of you just kind of put yourself out there? Yeah. So the the, the, the creepy question, and I, I, it's interesting. I think if you do it correctly, um, people never even kind of go to that creepy place. So let me kind of unpack that a little bit. So first of all, if somebody puts a public post out saying, I'm launching chicken fries today, and you say, we bought your chicken fries and they were delicious, that's not creepy, because it's a public conversation. Now, if he sent a private message to you know his wife, saying, I'm kind of nervous about today's being chicken fries, and suddenly we were in that feed, that would be weird, and that would be creepy, right? But these public conversations, we find, I mean, we did like millions of them at Microsoft, and we had pushback once or twice. And it was because it is the thing that people are putting out there. So that that I'm sort of that feels easy. The second one, which is the point drive one, you know, in point drive it is like it's clear that you're inside LinkedIn and you're inside the community. As long as you sort of stay within the community standards of LinkedIn and is LinkedIn member to LinkedIn member, which is a lot more it gets a lot more manual than the old sort of marketing automation style of things. But people have not been pushing back on that either. Um, I think where it gets creepy is where people go, where did you get this information about me? That's, and that's the thing where, when an anonymous company attempts to be familiar with someone in a way that they did not actually give that information up, that is super weird and I don't like that at all. Now, if a person at a company like Sammy is talking about eating chicken fries and Sammy's got appendicitis and he's saying a thing to say, like that's all actually okay. And it was interesting when, when Sammy got the package from Burger King, um, she opens the door and there's this box sitting on her or I guess her mom opened the door because she was in bed. And this is box, and it's with Burger King sent you a box. And Sammy's first thought was, how did they get my information? And she realized she'd entered a contest. It's part of the back and forth that they were going, and that's how they had it. So I think it's, the more human you are, the less creepy it is. And where people are uncomfortable is they don't like an anonymous things, entities, knowing a lot of stuff about them. Even that feels like a little people loved it. One person, <laughs> no, people love those things like, because they were talking about Xbox, right? They were talking about it and often expecting us maybe uh, over time people sort of expect us to kind of enter the conversation. We're seeing things now with listening because listening's gotten so much more sophisticated. You know, you're, you're not just listening to your own anymore, you're listening more broadly. Uh, I had one the other day where someone said, Hey, Sprint, they're just testing out how good your listening is, and they weren't app mentioning or hashtagging us or anything. And so I, and I actually was uh, sent to me within Sprinkler by my CXE. So I responded and said, yep, see you. Okay. And then they wrote another one, which was, do you see this one, Sprinkler? And they spelled Sprinkler wrong. And we got that one too. <laughs> uh, and so there's a little bit of people starting to expect people to listen. That's a little bit of the reality of it. Um, one person, when we did an Xbox ad for them, said, oh my god, Microsoft did an ad an ad just for me today. This is like the greatest day of my life, which is pretty awesome. And you know, it's like sad 
it's sad as well. But uh, but it's also <laughs> mostly awesome, mostly awesome, right? And so so that to me is like I, I think that's if it's done in the spirit of humanity and it's done in the spirit of sort of kind of giving and not done in a way that's meant to be exploitive, I think people like it because they're, they're connecting with someone. Greg Kahn of Sprinkler, thank you for helping us understand how important human to human and personalization is. We all have, we have a 20 minute break. When, when the break's over, we're going to be talking about Instagram stories, and uh, we hope you'll.